Don, 31, mother, second generation Vietnamese American, born and raised in South Seattle. I work at the Winglet Museum as the senior tour manager. Mom and dad came over as refugees in the late 1980s. I have two brothers, I'm middle daughter. Growing up in Burien uh, Elementary School, oftentimes I was the uh, only uh, Vietnamese American student in the class. That would continue into high school, eventually kind of pushed my Vietnamese heritage away. It wouldn't be until going to the University of Washington, taking American Ethnic Studies classes, learning more about myself that helped me find where I belonged. I was hoping to go to art school, but of course my family was like, you know, it's not a feasible direction to go into. And I saw a class about contemporary problems for Asian Americans, and taking that course helped me connect. I majored in American Ethnic Studies and focused on Asian American Studies. A handful of people I'm still connected to today. And after I found that place, I realized that I wanted to continue in education, but really advocate for diversity and representation. I just started out part-time at the museum, helping to lead tours. And then once I got in, they just can't kick me out. <laughs> I helped to oversee the education guides in the education and tours department. Working at the museum for now more than 10 years, it's a mixture of the all of the things that I really built myself on. So my identity, you have the art, of course, that we've got in some of the exhibitions, but really being able to share the history and then also um, see myself included in it. I moved out of Berrien approximately two years ago. That was because I got pregnant. I actually met my partner, Vincent, who was also a student in the psychology, but then also went into um, American Ethnic Studies as well. For the both of us, we, we really have a love for the neighborhood in Seattle. That's where we hung out a lot and um, definitely wanted to move closer to the Chinatown neighborhood. I just wanted for my son a uh, different kind of experience. Just being able to walk around in a neighborhood where you can see that there are a lot of folks who look like you. When the news of COVID-19 came out, then Lunar New Year happening around that time, late January, and these ideas that it was around eating bats, I just knew that it was going to be stereotypes against anyone who looked Asian. Just so much xenophobia. It was around February, just taking a walk with my son in his stroller through uh, downtown Seattle. The city was just starting to get boarded up. We were just walking. And uh, there were some teenage kids, white, um, that were walking the opposite direction from us. And it was just them just doing exaggerated coughing. And then like, you know, laughing. Side glance. Nothing like hostile. But you knew the intention was there. And that was it. That was it. It's dumb crying thinking about it, but there was so much that could have happened. Sorry. <laughs> there was, you know, there was so much that I wanted to do in the, in the time that passed. You know, I could have taken some kind of action to at least yell something back, but just seeing uh, what happens in police encounters when it comes to 
young white men and uh, older people of color. We know that the outcome isn't good. So I couldn't, you know, risk anything happening to my partner who would be stereotyped as a darker skinned male who would be seen as a threat to these young boys kind of thing. And then there's my son. So we just kind of kept on walking. That was before a mandate to wear face masks. So we were looking like the odd ones out with the masks. And then my <laughs> my son, he's in his stroller and we have like a plastic cover. And that was the only time we got that experience, but it was enough. Well, I've just been staying home, stay out of it. I felt like when it came to the murals, I think it's fascinating because the last time that the community was ever boarded up was during the 1940s when Japanese Americans were put into incarceration camps. I talk about that a lot at the museum and seeing the photographs of places being boarded up, everything looked like, you know, a ghost town. This is the stuff that's repeating again. What I said the other night, there's never been anything where they have so many names. I could give you 19 or 20 names for that, right? It's got all different names. Wuhan. Got Wuhan was catching on. Coronavirus, right? Kung flu, yeah. Kung flu. Trump calling the coronavirus Kung flu, China flu, Wuhan virus. It's just a repeating of everything that we've seen across history. You know, it's really depressing that we haven't moved forward. I think it started out with Jade Garden being the first place that got the murals. But over time, right, there was Skipta and uh, S. Dot, who were also involved with helping to just board up uh, the different restaurants and businesses in the neighborhood. Thinking back on the murals, you had a theme of definitely Black Lives Matter. You had Asians for Black Lives, too. Some of them were just kind of um, painted around the theme of the restaurants that they had boarded up. We had cute food stuff and just letting people know that these spaces are still open. At first seeing it, I was pretty, it, it made me feel happy to see it because it wasn't something that you'd seen before. Anti-blackness is something that is prevalent in uh, Asian American communities. The community in itself is made up of a lot of different people. You have elders, you have children, you have adults, and they all come with different perspectives and experiences. And the more they educate themselves or learn more about where Asian and Black um, history collides and intersects. If you take a look at Seattle's history around redlining, right? Uh, restrictive covenants in Seattle, who was allowed to live where according to what they looked like. For those communities who were marginalized, having to live in those spaces, the worst places in Seattle, they had to make the best of it and their relations together were just fine. The Black and Tan Club, right, 12th and Jackson, that is historically where today is Little Saigon. It was once Japantown, but heading towards the Central District. That was a place where it wasn't just black folks who were hanging out, but um, all of the other communities who were being marginalized, those were spaces that were open and welcome to them. Those communities were able to 
get along a lot better with each other. You can kind of see then uh, what relations were like for communities of color in Seattle. New immigrants coming in to the United States, what is the first thing that they're sold? That's the idea of this American dream. If you work hard enough, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. When you look at um, the rules that are put into place when these new immigrants come, it's stacked up against them and plays into model minority stereotype. Model minority is something that's used to pit the different communities of color against each other. You're elevating one in particular, the Asian community, right? And saying that, hey, look at the rest of these um, ethnic communities, these, these, uh, these other black and brown groups. Um, they've been here longer than these Asian ones have. Now, why can't the rest of them pick themselves up by their bootstraps and make it happen instead of sitting around and you know waiting for people to take care of them? If you break it down amongst the different Asian ethnic groups, not everyone's doing all the same either. The different Asian groups came into the United States um, under what guise they came under if they're coming in as refugees, right? That's a completely different entryway into the United States than someone who comes highly educated with lots of skills to get them into a good job and taking care of their families. So international students, um, it's, it's completely different, different playing level and field. This is a lot of stuff to explain, but that model minority stereotype, it's a myth. Looking at the murals today, I think the message is clear. Folks are trying to get out that black lives matter. And the people in this community, the people who are painting it, the artists, folks here, um, they're trying to say that they're standing behind it. It's important saying it because it wasn't something that was said when I was growing up. So I think this is a time uh, to make it known so that we don't forget. There's hope. Um, we're living in really weird times. And uh, it's kind of silly because I remember as an undergrad, you know, learning about the civil rights movement and being like, wow, these people, they're so brave. Um, you know, to stand up for what they believe in. And I remember saying things like, oh geez, I wish I could be living in that time so, so I can be brave too and, and do like they did, you know? But the funny thing is, I don't have to wish that because we're living in that time right now. This is our reality. People need to make their choice and decide on where they stand uh, for our community. You know, I think it's, it's clear, it's painted on the walls. Black lives do matter. I really like the one that was in Canton Alley, the one that we did at the museum, just because it was a really great example of the various leaders amongst BIPOC communities. So you had like Donnie Chin, Betty Luke, Wing Luke of course. <laughs> I, I just love that um, cross community cultural representation of what kind of leadership has been seen across the board in the Chinatown International District. There's just, there's just so many different murals. They all come with their different styles.
some of them I like for their simplicity. So that um, kind of like pharmacy that's right next door to Tai Tung where it's like just blue and white hues. It makes me think of like the jade kind of porcelain of a certain kind of, you know, dynasty area where everything was only white and blue and that was cute. I think it is Ho Ho Seafood Restaurant that actually built like hinges on their boards. So whenever their restaurant is open, they just flip it down like a window. So it's really cool to see the different styles and the just the cleverness behind a lot of the pieces too and how it operates with the businesses that they are protecting. It's not just the businesses that painted them. It's actually a collaboration between the business owners and the mural artists. It's a beautiful collaboration between the two. What you're finding there on the surface of all of those paintings then are the messages that the local community members really want to get across in the neighborhood. For me, I see themes of just that resiliency. You're building on something that might have happened that was negative, but um, making it into something positive. That's kind of what I'm seeing with the murals in the neighborhood. In this hard time that we're in, uh, we're gonna see it through. Even though our neighborhood is taking on a different look because of the xenophobia, because of attacks, white supremacy out there, we're gonna protect our spaces but still see the beauty in it.